Good morning. I'm from Claire, and we're relatively new to the Interledger community, and uh, we've been thinking a lot about, for a long period of time, about how we're going to solve a particular challenge for our product, and we had different ways that we were uh, approaching this ourselves. We were looking at different options in the market, and uh, we arrived at Interledger after seeing the, the pitfalls of other solutions, and Interledger fit perfectly for our use case. And uh, that use case is we're launching a new distributed network, and uh, we're not issuing a token for this network, and we're using Interledger to handle uh, node remuneration, node operator remuneration in our network. And so um, I'm just going to run through. Uh, this is a forum post that I've made on the Interledger forum. I've made three posts. Uh, this is part two in that series. And this dives into the, some of the details about uh, exactly how we do this, we use Interledger for the node remuneration. I'm not going to get too deep into like the technicals of our actual distributed network. I'm, instead, I wanted to focus today just on the the the, um, the exact way that we use Interledger for for this, and why I want to compare it as well to other options in the market, and why Interledger was and our own. We had our own ideas too that we wanted to to see, and we by going through this process, we understood a lot of the deep design challenges, uh, design decisions that were made in Interledger, and it made a lot of sense for us. And so um, this is a, the, one of the simplest um, structures of a, of a Flare network, which is, this, which is the name of our network. And we're, we use the same style of consensus as uh, Ripple or Stellar, which is the federated Byzantine Agreement consensus. And the difference, uh, key difference for our network is that we can support uh, Turing complete smart contract engines. So uh, the first uh, Flare network that we're launching next month is running the Ethereum virtual machine, but it's totally uh, a pluggable interface for that. And we're going to be ABCI compliant, uh, which is Tendermint's um, uh, interface for putting in virtual machines on top of these, these systems. And so uh, there's no native token in, in our network. And, uh, and the way that uh, the nodes form the network is, is just like in uh, Ripple or Stellar, they, they, issue, they express how they trust other nodes in the network, and then uh, market forces cause overlaps of trust that give you the, the definition over control in the network. And so in this ex example of uh, a Flare network here, there's uh, four nodes, and these are uh, expressed by uh, nodes uh, V1 to V4. And uh, the trust lines here are uh, V1 trusts uh, nodes two and four, but doesn't include uh, V3 in its in its trust set. But because uh, V2 or V4 include V3 in its trust set, that means that V1 depends on uh, V3 to externalize its transactions. So from V1's point of view, like a quorum here would be nodes two through four, whereas the inner nodes here, they don't depend on uh, the, the outer node, V1. And this is how the Federated Byzantine Agreement networks avoid uh, the Sybil attack, which means that they can avoid large sets of nodes that come into the network that try to uh, assume, uh, take control over the network. And it's nice about this style of consensus, it doesn't rely on, on putting money up to control, to, to get power in these networks. And so it's useful to express large amounts of, say, value on these networks, and also for just applications that just shouldn't be controlled by by money, you just have a the useful uh, governance property here, which which works well in practice at, with the XRP ledger and uh, Stellar. And so, uh, in this example, um, the user submits a transaction to this outer node, and the payment uh, mechanism is that we let the validators choose what currencies they want to be accepting. Uh, to get remunerated, and we let them uh, also set their, their fee for how they want to do that, and they can change that as they wish. And since the user pays this outer node, it will pay all of the nodes that that node would depend on in its quorums, in all of its potential quorums that could happen. In this initial example, it will pay the full 16 units times the gas cost of its uh, transaction, and directly to, that, uh, to the, all of those nodes, and uh, in this example, the user instead submits to this inner quorum that doesn't depend on this outer node. And in, in that case, uh, the outer node wouldn't get paid for that, but the, the inner quorum would get paid. 
and uh, they would uh, he would well this this uh, this node would pay 14 uh, units instead of 16. And this is a more realistic example of like the style of uh, uh, network that you you can achieve with a federated Byzantine agreement network, and you can have these uh, tiers of of uh, um, of, of nodes that, that the market forms, and there's no clear definition over what should be, say, a top tier set of nodes. The market forms that based on what everybody trusts as being in that, in that set of nodes. And it's not just like a nested set of nodes. You can have interesting things like parallel uh, side um, tiers that are also assumed to be quite important. So this is, uh, this is an example from um, a talk uh, from about the stellar consensus protocol it's just it's it's an example where these four nodes could be a uh, say a set of banks and then these outer nodes could be uh, say nonprofit organizations that are are neutral and um, some of these nodes might depend on these other nodes but it's everybody has their independent choice over how they choose uh, trust in this network the reason I chose this example is to show that uh, say this user submits the transaction to, to node v12 and the user can externalize their transaction with a quorum that would be, for example, uh, node V12. And then since V12 would require two out of four of these, inner, these, these next tier of nodes, that could be uh, nodes V8 and V9. And then they, this, this set of nodes would require two out of four of these, these nodes in this category. And then they require three out of four. So a quorum for, for, for the user in this, in this uh, way that they submit the transaction could be V1, V2, V3, V8, V9, V12. But the way that we, we do the remuneration is that we take all, of, all sets of possible quorums that, that, node, that the outer node would be exposed to. So we, the, the node would pay nodes, the, sorry, the user would pay nodes V1 to V12, in this case, times the gas cost. And uh, we want to simplify the user experience here, so we don't want the user to have to worry about uh, paying all of these nodes. We want the user just to pay the outer node that they submit the transaction to, and let this node then handle the payments to these, these downstream nodes, and worry about how the fees change and everything. And what would ha typically happen in practice is that there's, uh, say, a business that depends on the Flare network or fed you know, any federated Byzantine agreement network. They would only allow transactions submitted to their node that relates to their business, say, would be one possible case. And people can charge uh, extra than if they are a node, if they're, if they're a node that accepts transactions from the outer world, they have to run some extra infrastructure usually to handle that, so they can charge a fee extra on that. But if it depends on their business, they can uh, just let that go for, for free. This mechanism, this wide payment mechanism, instead of like depending on like exactly what quorum is the one that externalizes the tra transaction is a way to motivate the nodes to be quite selective in how they form their quorums uh, because they have to pay more money. They, 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 by having wider quorums, they, they pay more money to the, to the nodes downstream. So they, they're naturally incentivized to be selecting uh, smaller uh, quorums. But the user as well has the control over, they won't submit a transaction to a node that is uh, not giving them safety. So if the nodes don't have enough, no if, the, if a node they submit a transaction to doesn't have enough uh, nodes in their quorum, the, the user, they, they won't naturally get uh, a lot of uh, payments going through them because the, the users just won't select them or more, what's more likely the business that runs that node won't select nodes in their quorum that don't give them safety. And uh, to run through like the concrete steps over how Interledger is used in this case, and I'll talk a bit about the pitfalls of doing other mechanisms that are not the, this, uh, that don't have the, the properties that are really useful in Interledger, uh, and some, some initial uh, cases that we tried, that we, the, we investigated, is um, we, we assume that um, the, the node will, uh, the, as I said, the user will prepay their, um, their credit to some, uh, in, like node that they submit transactions to directly, and this this node will pay the downstream nodes, and so in this in this case the user say prepays um, 200 units times uh, 20,000 uh, a, a gas cost of 20,000 
and uh, this gives them quite a high uh, bandwidth, and this can uh, carry over for many transactions that the user does, so they, they pay just once and they don't have to really worry about it then. And the user submits their, uh, their actual transaction on the Flare network to, to that node, and the, the, the node itself, uh, V1 in this case, would then pay the downstream nodes. And what, what our um, assumption here is that this, this node V1 would have a prepayment to these, to these uh, other inner nodes that would allow them over this period of time to have um, enough uh, money that if, if, the, if this node here doesn't issue this payment, it would have issued a, a deposit to these other nodes before that point. The idea that how you stream uh, payments over Interledger makes perfect sense for, for this style of use case. And um, this, uh, this capital N here is the, the, the amount of time that you allow between uh, uh, blocks before like payment actually occurs. So you, you have um, predefined checkpoints when the payment occurs and um, these, uh, th these, this, this gives you, this, this uh, value of N has to be at least one um, so you could have it say every every single block you you issue this this new um, this this payment occurring to the to the downstream nodes, and but what's what would actually be useful like we let them we let any flare network it's not just one flare network by the way that we're running you can have multiple different flare networks, and we let the networks choose this parameter n, and it would be quite useful to have say larger values of this n to to allow instances like this over here where say a node changes its fee and the node then wants to remove that uh, node from its, from its quorum, it can, uh, it can do that before uh, it actually takes effect on the network. And um, this, is, this is a way to uh, separate the, the actual payment mechanism from the actual running of, of this network because what, what was a challenge previously is like if you try to um, f fully uh, like uh, say um, run all of the uh, like say um, draw draw a token into this network, um, you, you'd have to have some support for honoring the value of that token going back down to, to like an underlying ledger somewhere. We don't even assume that's a token that's getting paid. It could be like a fiat that's getting paid to these nodes to over interledger. And this mechanism allows nodes to like stream their payments uh, to to the other nodes. And um, this is yeah, this, this is pretty much the the, the model. Um, it's it makes perfect sense to use Interledger for us to to have this streaming of payments that the, the if the nodes um, are are malicious, they can uh, just take back their deposit over over this period of time, and it. Uh, is quite quite like a, a perfect uh, use case we feel for for Interledger with with our system and it, it's it actually it, it's it's a it's like a, it's a recall to the idea of like using Interledger with Codius, uh, for example, and like paying um, uh, like Codius node operators, and uh, this this is a um, we think it's going to be a really useful uh, mechanism for this. Um, yeah. So all all the nodes can be accepting whatever asset they want, or are they all like? How's everyone? How do you know the units that we're deciding the prices for in a particular flare network? Yeah. So the so the question was, uh, how do you define what the units are for this particular flare network if every node can accept different uh, assets, and this is. Why this is in particular why we um, allow the user to submit to this this initial node and only have to worry about how they accept money, and then that that node would handle that complexity of paying different uh, you know different nodes in their select currency. And then what's useful in using Interledger in this case is that the Interledger protocol can handle that complexity about streaming the payments uh, in their into the other node operators in their uh, currency of choice. So is it less like everyone's telling a price in a, a uniform asset or unit uh, and 
instead of that, it's that each node just has a price in whatever they accept. Does that make sense? Yeah, like this, uh, this um, example is, is uh, it's assuming just one style of um, currency. So it's just for the, the example, just to show that the, the outer node um, has like a, a set of like a ex assumed uh, total value of what they, they would accept. And then they would uh, pay the, the downstream nodes their correct amount of, of money. And they, they would pay that uh, downstream set of nodes just what they were owed for that period of time. And then uh, that it could be in different currencies, but if you take the, the total value of currencies, you get some total like unit value for that. And what we do is by having these uh, periods of time inside of these uh, these uh, capital N periods between blocks, we, we allow all changes to to occur, but so, such as changing what currencies you, you accept or what your quorum slices are, but they won't they won't take effect until after that uh, next capital N period of time. So it will remain fixed during that period of time. And then after that period of time, uh, you would know then exactly how, how you should pay those currencies. So you're not dealing with a challenge where the quorum slices are constantly changing, for example, and the currencies are constantly changing. You have a, a useful uh, checkpoints that you know exactly what should be paid. Yeah. Have you got any <clears throat> ideas at this point of use cases for the Flare network itself? What are the use cases you're talking about? Yeah, so one of the use cases that we're particularly interested in is, uh, so on the Flare network as well, um, we, we allow the, we, we use the XRP ledger uh, key um, algorithm. We, we swap that out for in, in the Ethereum virtual machine. So we let the user hold on just to one key. And they can, exp they can have an asset that's, say, a securitized asset, and that can be expressed in a contract form from its inception on the Flare network with all of the KYC restrictions and trading restrictions that would apply to that. And an exchange could plug into the Flare network on one side and then say the XRP ledger on the other side for liquidity for that asset. And it would all be unified to that one key that the user has. But there's also many other interesting applications that apply because this network is not controlled by just putting more money into assume, into gaining like power for for the nodes to gain uh, control over the consensus, any sort of real world asset, any sort of real world application, say um, like the pharmaceutical industry, putting some information on onto this network that has a real world value somewhere else. That say say if the value exceeds the amount of uh, value that you would use to uh, say stake in in some cases. Um, some other types of consensus. This this is useful because you allow the the these networks to form that are not based on just putting like um, more like money towards this consensus. So any any sort of real world um, uh, anything with like high value, we think it's uh, quite quite a that that's not um, can't be perturbed by um, just spending more money to gain control over the network. It's we, we just see it as like a, a useful um, layer for people to be able to, to use. They can uh, have a, this, this contracting layer that they can uh, just express um, any sort of contract that you can on Ethereum. And it's, uh, it's all tied to the same uh, user's key. Also, like these, uh, these networks can uh, form however they want, so they, they can also be uh, like centralized networks themselves if they, if they want to be, but we think it's, it's useful to let the market figure that out. And uh, it, we think it's quite it's just an interesting proposition to have a network that's not controlled by a token and to have this type of model where the, the node operators are, are also then given, they, they know they'll have a stable, um, they'll have an understanding of like what the, um, over a period of time, how much money they could make because they can now earn in fiat for their service. Whereas like a node operator, it, trying to earn a token for for their service, it's it's quite a volatile uh, thing over say say a year. How much money they're going to make over that year, if the underlying token that they're earning is is constantly changing in value, they can now earn in a stable uh, value right away for their service, which has been quite popular with uh, node operators as well that we've been talking to. And uh, so this has been built since December, by the way, and we're just currently undergoing. Uh, pen testing for it. Uh, we're launching next month, 
in a beta version and uh, the, the yeah, we're we're excited to be using interledger for for this uh, for this platform I think it's a perfect fit for us awesome, thank you